States of America. Citizens United case, one year ago, we said the corporations have the same rights of people to spend their money however they want on elections. There's almost no restrictions, and that's the way it should be because corporations are people. Don't you see what's happening in the United States? We voted to give the corporations even more control over our elections than they already had. And we sold out the American people one more time. I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I voted against this awful idea. I'm Justice Clarence Thomas, and I'm an Oreo. I believe my colleagues just bought the best democracy money can buy. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delft and I host this series of half-hour weekly public access program programs. So uh, today our guests are Jennifer Schubert, uh, who is the co-founder of CORE, calling Oregon, calling Oregon to reinvest in education. She holds a PhD in religion from the University of Chicago and is currently a professor of religion at Portland State University. Great. And also we have Dr. Marsha Klutz, Klutz. Klutz. <laughs> who is an assistant professor of English at Portland State University. She was granted a PhD in German studies from Stanford University, is also co-founder of CORE, calling Oregon to reinvest in education. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Good, yeah. First of all, before we get to our main topic, which is about uh, education, uh, uh, I, I, on the website, uh, it says you're both fixed-term professors, and I'm wondering what does that mean uh, versus like a tenured professor or um, an adjunct professor? What's the difference? Well, the distinction is that a tenure-line person usually comes into the university system and has a period of five to seven years when they are tested out. And after that point, they go through a tenure trial. And at that point, they're either promoted, in which case they receive full tenure, and they have job security more or less for life, unless they do something absolutely egregious. Okay. If they don't achieve tenure at that point, they have to find a new job. They're kicked out, usually. Fixed-term faculty is a kind of rolling contract. Sometimes you have a contract of two to three years. Most contracts just go year to year. I have been at Portland State University for eight years now, and I only have an annual contract. Uh -huh. That means they can let me go at the end of the year if they uh -huh. choose to, and they can also change the terms of my contract when it rolls up, which they did this last year. Oh, okay. And, and then uh, is it possible then for, for you to go from fixed term to tenure track? It happens sometimes. Happens. Rare. But it's rare. a rare yeah. event. Oh, okay. It basically gives the university a lot more flexibility. Uh, it certainly sounds like it. Right. right. Okay. And, and adjunct professor, what is that? So uh, adjunct, and I have to say, I was coming from Chicago, and I had actually never heard of fixed term. So Portland State um, is sort of ahead of the game in, in some ways because we're seeing people trying to create this sort of in-between, not tenure track, but not quite adjunct. Because adjunct is a person that's 
that's hired per class. And oh. so uh, you don't have the sort of two components. Um, you don't have even the longevity of a, a year. We, as fixed term, know we're teaching for three quarters. Mm -hmm. uh, an adjunct could be called up the day before and say, your class is you know, not there, you're, you're not um, hired. Uh -huh. um, and which happens regularly. Which happens regularly. Uh -huh. um, so that's the flexibility issue. And the other piece of that is that adjuncts um, at PSU, and this happens depending on the um, institution, but this is um, common. If you're not at what they call 0.5, at 0.5 they have to give you benefits. And so they keep adjuncts, and there's a certain formula for how many classes you teach, they keep them below 0.5 so uh, that they don't have to offer them benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and adjuncts uh, are becoming more and more the workforce. and. You know, students aren't often aware that their professors um, could be anywhere from the tenure track to the fixed term or adjuncts who might be working at two and three other institutions and might be making $16,000 a year teaching five courses. Oh. Um, so there's a range of job security as well as um, benefit issues as well as salary. So, uh -huh. yeah. so my traditional view of, of professors making a reasonable amount of money is probably not accurate anymore. It depends. Some do. And some, make, some, do. some make a reasonable Har amount. <laughs> oh, right. uh -huh. Harvard okay. professors are quite happy. Uh, okay, right. Okay. But, but, down but the, here in the, the shift, <laughs> the shift in the focus of the universities is they're trying to hire more and more people mm -hmm. at the at, at a at lower, lower salary lower level uh -huh. and on a salary and, and on a system that will allow them maximum flexibility. Mm -hmm. It means that the the growing percentage of the workforce often has to commute from one campus to the next to the next. Mm -hmm. They don't have office space. And if a student, for example, has to drop out of a class or make something up the following quarter, they can't retake the class. They often can't find the professor who gave them uh. an incomplete. So this is all a function of a shift towards a more contingent workforce, a right. higher use of adjunct faculty. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. So lots of ramifications that most people in the audience, including myself, had no idea. I just assumed that things were pretty much like they were in 1972 when I graduated <laughs> from Portland State where you had professors that were uh, not tenured yet and then you had professors that were tenured and that was the way that was. Okay. Another major issue that this raises is the reason tenure was brought in was to protect faculty from being unfairly targeted if they had an opinion or published a book that went against a party line. Mm -hmm. Tenure was meant to promote free speech by making sure that no one could take um, action against them because they didn't like their opinions. At this point, free speech has become so clearly associated with the tenure system that it's virtually unavailable to those of us who are on other kinds of contracts. And given that we are now the majority of the workforce in the university system, that means that effectively there is no system to protect free speech among mm. the majority of the faculty who are mm. serving. So that's another major change that's taken place as, uh -huh. as the workforce has shifted to fixed term and, and adjunct faculty. Okay, and it's interesting that you mentioned the set 1972 because in the 70s, just to give you numbers on a national scale, you had about 25% contingent faculty or part-time or adjunct and then 75% um, tenure track and now it's the reverse. We're down to 25% tenure track and about 70 and that's the, the across the um, the nation. So some obviously universities will be um, different than Lower, that. higher, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well this has been an interesting discussion. <laughs> Wait, not, not what we were intending to talk about, but still I, I think it's kind of illuminating. <laughs> right. Yeah, so um, calling Oregon to reinvest in higher education or in, in education. So uh, what's the mission of, that's abbreviated CORE, mm -hmm. so what's the, what's the mission of CORE? Go ahead. Uh, so uh, we decided, it's interesting that you say higher education because it seems like, well, aren't we just interested in that? Um, we are focused on that at this point, um, but our interest is in education more generally because obviously we are receiving students who have been educated in a K through 12 system, mm -hmm. which if they are not adequately prepared, don't do well in college. Um, and so that's why we, we decided when we formed this to leave it open as education, and we've been working with other groups as well. Um, but our mission is to uh, do a couple things, which is to broaden who uh, we want to be paying attention to these issues, to faculty, students, and citizens, that this is not just 
faculty talking about tenure versus contingent, or this isn't just students talking about debt issues, or this isn't just sort of politicians or community members, um, you know, saying, well, education is important. Um, but to really bring people together um, who are invested in this, to start seeing the connections between the student's experience, the faculty's experience, taxpayer issues, where the funding comes from. Um, and so it's an awareness raising um, uh, organization, but, uh, and to get information out to these groups and to show them that they have something in common. And then we have other goals uh, that, I don't know if you want to speak to, the more specific goals. Um, well, we're working with, in collaboration <laughs> with a national organization called the Campaign for the Future of Higher Education. And that group is formed with the explicit mission of trying to defend accessible quality higher education across the nation against a variety of different onslaughts. I am a member of the faculty union, the AAUP, um, but we wanted to make it clear that the union issues and the faculty issues really go hand in hand with student issues because oftentimes people think that mm -hmm. somehow faculty salaries mean that faculty won't be, be interested in rising tuition rates and um, in, interested to in, in making sure that, that higher education is accessible. So we're really trying to kind of reach out to these different groups and form a, a broader coalition where everyone can participate together. Okay, okay. all right, great. And the, uh, the website uh, says that the problems facing Oregon are part of a general crisis in, in higher education. And what's the general crisis? What's that large crisis look like? I would say that the major shift of uh, the, the the major focus the, of of the onslaught against higher education right now has to do with a steady corporatization of the logic of higher education. As state funding for higher education has dwindled nationally, corporations have begun more and more to treat universities as a kind of place where profit can be gleaned. We have seen a tremendous um, influx of business people in administrative positions, which means that the governance of the campus is not being run by people who have experience in the classroom and who prioritize providing high quality education at every possible juncture, but rather by people who are really looking to a logic of the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And they're finding ways of squeezing more and more profit out of the institution, looking to private public um, partnerships, looking to raise tuition, looking to different places where they can basically treat us as workers who are delivering a product rather than educators looking to develop the minds of the students who come to us. And that, that to me is really what mm -hmm. the, the basic issue is that we're facing on a number of different levels. Okay. Okay. You want to add anything to that? Um, just to, to reiterate, I think that the um, uh, the model of education that many people are used to, um, and especially if, uh, as uh, you mentioned, you were there a couple decades ago, um, if you looked at the qualifications of the people who are now running in the institutions, um, you, it used to be, oh, the person who was an English professor became the dean or became um, the president or what have you. Um, you're seeing uh, not just that those people that were English professors now become business people, but literally those are different people. And so s more and more you have people that could be working at any corporation are now being hired by the universities to apply those sorts of business practices to the university, um, as, as Marcia said. And so you have the logic within the university, and then those people who also have all of these ties to mm -hmm. corporate America and these other, that, that want to, um, uh, make uh, connections between the university that in our minds are not often uh, focused on educational goals or research goals, which is for us the core mission of universities mm -hmm. is the students and research. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. They, so on the one hand, we're calling on legislators to invest more public funds in higher education. That's absolutely crucial. But on the local level, we're also very concerned with what's happening to the funds that are coming in right now. We're seeing a shrinking percentage of money actually going back to the classroom as more and more money goes to develop fancy new buildings and establish research partnerships with private enterprises. Basically, 
the logic of administration tends to be one that views the students as consumers and that's very focused on branding various universities in order to compete with other institutions and attract consumers, preferably from out of state, because they'll pay a higher tuition level. Mm -hmm. So as that becomes the goal of the university, all kinds of different things fall into place that put pressure on us and make it really difficult for us to perform our jobs in a meaningful way. Okay. All right. And um, one, of, one of the things that you sent me Mm -hmm. uh, to kind of get myself up to speed a little bit was something, some testimony that you gave to the Oregon legislature about the Oregon Governor's University. Mm -hmm. Western it, Governor's University. Western Governor's yep. University, which when I first read that, I thought, oh, this is another government agency. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I read in a little bit further, it was quite different. It's actually a nonprofit um, how would you describe it? They describe it as a private nonprofit, private nonprofit. university. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the um, as I, I as you said, I, I testified before the Oregon Education Investment Board, which is the new uh, uh, body basically created by uh, legislation and um, from the the past, not the current um, February legislation, but uh, last year's. And that board is supposed to oversee education from zero through higher ed, so this seamless education. And within uh, their research, they're putting forward promising practices. And I've been going to these meetings, and one of the promising practices that they had on uh, listed in December was this Western Governors University. And uh, I didn't know what it was. Like you, I thought, mm -hmm. Well, it has the word governors in it, it's uh, yeah. a university, uh -huh. what is this? So what um, I've come to learn about it is Western Governors University was founded by some Western governors in the Montana and, and Utah in particular. It's, it's based in Utah in the 90s. However, it is a private nonprofit. It is not uh, a government agency at all. And it's completely online, and it's called competency-based education. And so what that means is that uh, when we think of courses, even if you took an online course where you would sign up for math, you know, 100 or what have you, and there'd be other students and you would have a textbook and curriculum, that's not there at all. What you do is you sign up for a six-month course, if you will, and again, the language becomes very difficult of, well, what's a course and what's faculty, and you take assessments. So you're doing kind of assignments that you would just pass or fail. There are no grades, and once you pass or fail, you can move to the next level, if you will, competency. And so you have um, someone called a mentor who is, uh, when they testified before the um, Oregon legislator, a mentor was there and she described herself kind of like a life coach, kind of like a psychiatrist and what have you. She calls them up to say, you know, have you done your assignments and things, but she's not a professor that has any knowledge about the content of these these courses. Oh, so so if, if I was taking the class mm -hmm. and, and I wasn't clear about a concept or an mm -hmm. idea or process, she wouldn't be, or he wouldn't mm -hmm. be actually able to answer the question. Right. But she could yes. put you in contact with someone else who's a higher level mentor. Oh. And sometimes these people have um, discussion sections where they will have a group of students call in and ask questions. Oh. But basically they're, they're there to kind of provide links to further content. They're not really supposed to be leading you through the material the way I do when I put together a course curriculum, right. for okay. example. So they're kind of pointing you down this road to get an answer instead of providing some kind right. of answer. Right. Okay. And you can see there's no sort of discussion, what we might think of as critical thinking skills. There's, mm -hmm. there's no um, interaction between the students in the way that we would think of um, having a classroom. And also, uh, the competencies, as, as you pass them, people have questioned, um, one of our big concerns is that they won't release their accreditation materials, and that sounds very esoteric, but people haven't been able to see exactly what are these classes like. The descriptions are kind of vague, and in Washington a State, um, there was a lot of uh, uh, concern about this, and I'll explain why in a minute, but uh, people have said uh, that when looking at the curriculum that it looks more like test preparation um, or the math, for instance, people said, this looks like remedial math. It doesn't look like university level math. Um, it, but it's very hard to figure out what's even being taught. 
And so that's a critique we would also like to know. And the reason I was at the Oregon Education Investment Board is because Western Governors um, is now an official part of university systems in Indiana, Texas, and Washington State. And there's legislation right now that's pending to have a task force to investigate whether we should make them part of our university system. And you can see that that's the privatization mm -hmm. of a public higher education system. Mm -hmm. And what it would mean on very practical levels is, is two things. One, students could use financial aid that they before could only use for state schools, um, Oregon Education Inve um, Opportunity Grants. They can now use that for this other school, which is sending money out of state. It's not creating jobs within the state. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, it's free advertisement and saying a Western Governor's University degree is equivalent to something you could get at U of O or PSU. And that's where we disagree. We think this competency-based model is actually creating a two-tiered system. Um, and it's going to be you know, the, the wealthy who can afford the private institutions who get professors. And everyone else gets these competency exams mm -hmm. and mentors. Um, and that's what we're concerned about, that the, there's going to be, um, by bringing in Western governors, you're going to legitimate a model of higher ed that is that very problematic. Really, uh -huh, right, yeah. It's not okay. education in our mind, uh -huh, yes. Right, yeah. Because part of the education process is the discussion that goes on between the professors and the students among the, among the students. And that doesn't happen in this model. That's precisely what education is. Uh -huh. It's about the kind of interaction that takes place between people in a real classroom, in a real environment. And we're, we're not against online education well, across the board. There are certainly places, if for example you want to study Hindi here in, in Portland and you, there, there are no classes or Sanskrit, I can sure understand why you might want to be able to engage in some kind of online learning of something that isn't offered. but. It shouldn't be substituted for the full-on process of learning what it means to become a teacher or a nurse. And, and these are the areas where they, they don't offer degrees in traditional disciplines. They offer degrees in healthcare, in education, in computer technology, and in business. And it's, it's, it's especially the first two that I find very problematic. Uh -huh. I sure wouldn't want my kids to be going to school with a teacher who had gotten a degree in what basically amounts to kind of online correspondence course. Uh -huh. I don't right. know what kind of competency they would be able to learn that would begin to prepare them mm -hmm. for what it means to walk into a classroom with a bunch of nine-year-olds running around. Uh, yeah, it sounded, as you went through that list, it sounded to me like, wow, this is the correspondence schools or the technical schools of old. Exactly. Renamed as university. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah, their motto is they let the technology do the teaching rather than the faculty. And I'm sure that saves a lot of money. I'm uh -huh. sure it's a very efficient business model, but it's not a model of education. Hmm. And those, those who are supporting it see it as a kind of alternative to some of the online um, for profit programs mm -hmm. like University of Phoenix, which has just been disastrous in terms of graduation rates and just putting students in, pheno in phenomenal debt. Um, who, who get out of it often without a degree. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that one find alternatives to that kind of system, but it seems to me that giving an officially recognized and condoned alternative, in fact, ends up legitimating that approach to education, which feels to me like it's just the wrong way to go for our nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's just talk for a minute about private nonprofit. What does that mean? Uh, we know that uh, mm -hmm. you know, like University of Phoenix, obviously there's a profit motive there, mm -hmm. but there's, not a, there's no profit motive for, for the Western Governors University. Is that what we're saying? What are we saying? Well, <laughs> <laughs> for whom? Um, so nonprofit means that they don't have shareholders, that they're you know, distributing, they can't distribute a dividend to or something like that. Um, and so uh, the, the issue of who's getting rich off this, I think, is a question, question, right? Yes. <laughs> and so um, one thing you have to ask, and uh, many universities are nonprofit. Right, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we happen to P PSU is a public nonprofit, right? Um, and so there's often this feeling of, oh, if it's nonprofit, then one, it's it's good somehow. There's a bit mm -hmm. of that, oh, yeah. um, uh -huh. and because there's no profit motive. But in fact, the CEO of the president, I'm sorry, um, uh, President Mendenhall of Western Governors University, makes seven hundred thousand dollars a year, which is twice what the president of PSU makes. Mm -hmm. um, they are uh, 
able to pay administrators quite a bit of money. Um, so there's a question in my mind of within the, that actual structure, who's getting paid what? Um, and that's been something that people have critiqued at public nonprofits as well. Um, but there's something larger. I think that's connected is if you look at who's involved with Western governors, they have a national advisory board, um, and AT&T is on it, and Dell Computer, and all of these corporations who are advising them. You can also start to see and ask questions about who benefits from a model that shifts us from brick and mortars to legitimating completely online universities, and all the applications, right? Students still have to pay for all the stuff mm -hmm. and vendors are competing for that so I think that that's something to, to consider which is some of these nonprofits can also be um, ways for corporations to make the public comfortable with certain things and then mm -hmm. make money in that way so mm -hmm. I think there's two issues there with with it being nonprofit mm -hmm. um, and to speak to the issue of uh, the way the rhetoric has been working within um, the Obama administration actually invited Western governors, Obama, President Obama invited them to a summit on higher education costs in December. So these people got a seat at the table mm -hmm. with very few other higher education <laughs> institutions. Um, they're concerned that uh, the for profits will, um, uh, the for profits are the problem, and therefore Western governors, because it's nonprofit. Yes. So fixes the problem. So I think you're right. There is, there's a bit of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's, al it's always a concern to me when I hear about nonprofits doing things because they're, they seem to be automatically legitimate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas we question for profit thinking, wow, you know, they're in it for the money. Mm -hmm. But the nonprofits can be in it for the money also. Yeah. Right. 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 And anybody who works in the nonprofit industry can tell yeah. you that it's a it, it's a very flexible distinction between right. nonprofit and for profit. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we uh, have run out of time, unfortunately. Okay. But you're going to be back for our next yes. show. So uh, we are going to invite our audience to tune in for a continuing conversation with Jennifer and Marcia. And so uh, thank you very thank much you. for being here. Okay. Thank you for having right. us. Good. Thank you. All right, and that concludes our show today. Um, we want to call your attention to the contact information for Calling Oregon to Reinvest in Education. It's on your screen there. Facebook page, she said, is, is probably the best place to get uh, additional information. The website is very informative. Also, they have provided us with a list of additional materials which you might find of interest, and that is posted on the Populous Dialogues page, website page, which is populousdialogues.org. So we invite you to take a look at that. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www afd-pdx.org. Thanks to our crew today for being here and getting the show on the air. Joan Horton, Tom Thomas, Roger Bates, and Dave King. And we hope that you'll join us again next week. Bye.